Like most of the big questions in the historiography of the French Revolution, one of the things that's interesting about this question is it is as old as the period itself. No less a man than Beethoven engaged with this question. Beethoven was a huge admirer of the French Revolution, which he saw as a, as a progressive move forward for politics in Europe, and he saw Napoleon as the man who was carrying on the flame of the revolution into the 19th century. He was writing his third symphony in 1804, which he was going to call the Bonaparte Symphony in dedication to Napoleon. And then he found out that Napoleon had declared himself hereditary emperor something which seemed to go against all of the values of the revolution. And so the story goes, Beethoven ran to his manuscript, he scratched out Bonaparte and renamed it the Eroica Symphony, which is the name that it's known by today. So this question of whether Napoleon was continuing or betraying the revolution was something that animated contemporaries just as much as it's animated historians. And it's easy to see arguments on both sides. You can take that moment that so outraged Beethoven, Napoleon declaring himself emperor. That seems to be a kind of resurgence of the idea of hereditary privilege, which almost everybody can agree the French Revolution was against, whatever you think about the French Revolution. On the other hand, you can think of something like the civil code, the new legal system which Napoleon put in place, which seemed to enshrine and cement the idea of the equality of all citizens before the law for time immemorial. It's still the basis of the French legal code right up to this day. So it's very difficult to actually get a handle on this. But what I would suggest is while it's easy to kind of think of all of the stuff that we might with today's eyes think of as progressive, as kind of continuing the revolution, and all of the stuff that we might see as kind of authoritarian or reactionary as betraying the revolution, things are actually a little bit more complicated. I can give you two examples. First of all, let's think about the position of women. Now, the French Revolution was responsible for some advances in the position of women. Most notably, it made divorce a lot easier to get in France. Napoleon, he basically rubbed that out. He reversed it. He made divorce very difficult for women to get and a lot more easy for men to get in France. And so Napoleon is seen as, among other things, a kind of enemy of women's rights in France. But the revolution itself had not exactly been a kind of feminist utopia. In fact, many of the most radical revolutionaries were opposed to women having any kind of role in politics. So there's a particular incident we can think of in September 1793, where the revolutionary government essentially suppressed women's political clubs. And if you read the words of these Jacobin revolutionaries at the time, many of them were pretty unambiguous that a woman's place in the revolution was in the home, raising soldiers for the revolutionary armies and knitting their uniforms, or probably sewing their uniforms. It wasn't in frontline politics. So in many respects, we can see Napoleon's attitude to women as, as kind of basically a continuation of the revolution's attitude to women rather than some kind of radical break. Secondly, we can think about Napoleon's authoritarianism. Now, Napoleon was a man who censored newspapers, imprisoned his political opponents, and of course brought violence on an unprecedented scale to the European continent with the Napoleonic Wars. But again, there's a degree of continuity there. If we think back to the terror in the French Revolution, we see many of these kinds of means, and of course the French Revolution had also engaged on a new kind of warfare that was driven by ideas of patriotism and the nation. Napoleon essentially, we might say, exaggerated these and radicalised these in a new way rather than doing something new altogether. So when we're making arguments about whether Napoleon continued or betrayed the revolution, we're always also making arguments about what we think the revolution was in the first place. And what I would suggest is that we go wrong if we simply say all of the things that we think of as kind of good by today's standards were continuing the revolution, and all of the things that we think of as kind of bad and backwards by today's standards were betraying the revolution. Because actually what we see is that just like Napoleon, the revolution was an infinitely more complex phenomenon than that, and one that we can only grasp if we look at it in its own historical context.